are we who hear the joyful call to worship, for we walk in the light of God's presence. Let's worship God together, celebrating who he is and all that he has done. For God is our strength and our protection, the one in whom we trust. Sing of your steadfast love, O Lord, forever. Our, our souls, souls magnify the Lord. the Lord. With our mouths we proclaim God's faithfulness to all generations. Our, our spirits, spirits rejoice in God our Savior. We declare that your steadfast love is established forever. His, His mercy is to those who fear him from generation to generation. Your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. He, he has, has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. You are our God and our rock of our salvation. We joyfully gather to worship you.
Yahweh, as revealed to us through scripture, is unique among all of the gods of all of the surrounding nations, in that he forbade images to be made of him. Now, last week, I shared about one solitary exception to God's rule, and that was a shrine set up for Yahweh and his Asherah. And Asherah is the female counterpart to Baal. Both of these are well-known Canaanite gods. But even that particular shrine shows rough stick figure drawings of God. So we know that even at their worst, God's people took this prohibition very seriously. Now, what that means for us is that they had to find other ways to describe God. Instead of saying what God looks like, they used human terms to describe what God was like in terms of God's personality and God's character. Genesis 1, 26 and 27 is one of the first conversations we hear from God that should give us a glimpse into his character. It reads like this. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. What is confusing about this saying is that we were created in God's image, and yet we don't know what God looks like. Is there something essential to both female and male human beings that reflects God's image to the world? There must be. There also must be something about the personality and the character of maleness and femaleness that somehow reflects God's image, or else both would not have needed to be mentioned in this verse. Last week, I shared about how the unwillingness to speak of both masculine and feminine traits of God could be attributed to our attempts to avoid confusing people into thinking that God has two natures or that there are more, multiple gods, like the polytheistic religions of their day. And yet this didn't stop the church fathers from explaining God in terms of Trinity, which has caused the same misunderstandings. One of the teenagers I used to teach in her attempts to explain the Trinity to us ended up talking about the Trinity as God with a split personality. Now, God does not have a split personality. And yet we know from the history of the church that Christians have been accused of worshiping multiple gods, a similarly wrong conclusion because of our feeble attempts to explain who God is. It is inevitable that all of our attempts to understand God will fall short. But I've always believed that seeking to know and understand God will inevitably lead us to having a slightly clearer, slightly fuller, slightly more accurate picture of who God is. So today I'm going to try to present a slightly more complicated and yet still scripturally sound picture of God. We are all familiar with the picture of God as Father. This was spoken directly from the mouth of Jesus. Jesus paints another picture of God after talking about the judgment coming to the teachers of the law and the Pharisees in Jerusalem. Both Matthew 23 and Luke 13 refer to Jesus saying, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers. How often I have wanted to gather your children together as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings, but you wouldn't let me. This description of God as a mother hen is seen through the Old Testament as well although perhaps not as explicit as it's seen in Jesus' words. Psalm 91.4 speaks poetically of God, but uses a masculine pronoun. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Many Psalms make similar statements of God, gathering his children under his wings of protection. The Psalms have bolder descriptions of God, however, when they describe him as a midwife. Midwives of the time were considered doubly maternal. First, they would have already borne their own children. Then they helped others give birth, using their experience to reassure and safely guide new mothers through this process. 
Psalm 22, 9 and 10 compares God to the psalmist's mother, saying, Yet you brought me safely from my mother's womb and led me to trust you at my mother's breast, clearly identifying the physical mother's role in the birthing process. But then the psalmist transitions, and instead of describing his earthly mother, he speaks directly to God. I was thrust into your arms at my birth. You have been my God from the moment I was born. Psalm 90 verse 2 takes the analogy further still, using words of procreation, which could point to the father's role in the process. But it also uses words of birthing, words that are unique to mothers, as the psalmist describes the process of creation. Before the mountains were born, before you gave birth to the earth and the world, from beginning to end, you are God. In the ancient world, fathers and other men from the household were sent away during the birth, but not Yahweh. Yahweh stays through the entire birthing process. Psalm 139 says this of God, you knit me together in my mother's womb. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body. Your workmanship is marvelous. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion. You saw me before I was born. And unlike earthly mothers who need to be cared for by their children at the end of life, Yahweh is an eternal mother who would care for her children even when they are old. In Isaiah 46, 3-4, God says this, Listen to me, descendants of Jacob, all you who remain in Israel. I have cared for you since you were born. Yes, I carried you before you were born. I will be your God throughout your lifetime until your hair is white with age. I made you and I will care for you. I will carry you along and I will save you. Yahweh wants to be and is present for every part of the childbearing, child rearing, human cycle from life until death. A fun example in scripture comes from one of Moses' arguments with God. Here, the people were complaining about being stuck in the wilderness without food versus the good old days in Egypt where they presumably had all the meat and vegetables they wanted. Moses was understandably quite frustrated with them. And Moses said this to the Lord, why are you treating me, your servant, so harshly? Have mercy on me. What did I do to deserve the burden of all these people? Did I give birth to them? Did I bring them into the world? Why did you tell me to carry them in my arms like a mother carries a nursing baby? How can I carry them to the land you swore to give their ancestors? Where am I supposed to get meat for all these people? They keep whining to me saying, give us meat to eat. I can't carry all these people by myself. The load is far too heavy. Is this how you intend to treat me? Just go ahead and kill me then. Do me a favor and spare me this misery. You see, unlike the modern expectation that it's the father's job to provide for the family, in ancient times, feeding the children and making sure there was enough food for the children was actually the mother's job. Moses' response to God is basically Moses demanding of God. Am I their mother? No, you are, act like it. But there's also a balanced representation of male and female imagery of God in scripture. Psalm 27:10 compares God to either or both parents, saying, even if my father and mother abandon me, the Lord will hold me close. Psalm 123, one to two, use the language of both master and mistress, saying, I lift my eyes to you, O God, enthroned in heaven. We keep looking to the Lord our God for his mercy, just as servants keep their eyes on their master as a slave girl watches her mistress for the slightest signal. And Job 38, 28 to 29 describes God's role in creation, asking, does the rain have a father? Who gives birth to the dew? Who is the mother of the ice? Who gives birth to the frost from the heavens? In the biblical world, the cultural stereotypes viewed the father as severe, stern, and authoritarian, but the mother was viewed as loving and compassionate. Isaiah 63 verse 15 combines the stereotypical imagery of a father and a mother saying, Lord, look down from heaven. Look from your holy, glorious home and see us. Where is the passion and the might that you used to show on our behalf? And this is the typical masculine imagery. But then it asks, where are your mercy and compassion now? Using the language of a mother. One commentator wrote about this verse, God is both warrior proud and motherly tender. Neither mother nor father alone describes the true God. God is personal, but beyond human personality. 
And yet you could still argue that everything I've brought up is from the Old Testament. People had to use the descriptive language to describe God since God had not yet been revealed to us through Jesus. And Jesus calls God Father. End of story. But not quite. In John 3, Jesus had a very odd conversation with a Pharisee. Jesus tells the man that unless he is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Strangely, this is a phrase that many of us have repeated and claimed as descriptive of us, born-again Christians, without realizing how revolutionary this actually is. It's particularly shocking because of the stereotypical male behavior seen among the Greek and Roman gods. This involved procreating anywhere and everywhere with any female around, as you might have noticed by the myriads of demigods and all the wars between the various tiers of Greek and Roman gods throughout their entire mythology. As a side note, this is not how the birth of Jesus was described and would have actually been offensive to Christians. It would have made Jesus into a demigod as well, half human and half divine, while scripture is very clear that this is not how the birth of Jesus came about. The God of the Bible is very different. Our God does not procreate. He is not sexually active. And yet, in John 3, Nicodemus asks, can an old man go back to his mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus' response is that the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. This is a picture of procreation. It's a picture of new creation. It uses the language of physical birth, a process that requires a physical mother, and yet it takes on a deeper meaning. There are plenty of specific words in the Greek language that Jesus could have used instead of the language of birth. There are words that correspond solely to fatherhood, but physical birth corresponds solely to motherhood. And the last I checked, even our best scientists have still not figured out a way for men to conceive and give birth to an infant. So Nicodemus, of course, questions this, asking, how are these things even possible? In addition to using an example of childbirth as a picture of what it means to enter God's kingdom, Jesus flips all the pre-existing stereotypes of what it means to be a father completely upside down. The way fathers are described by Jesus would have been so shocking to the people he told them to. They offered good gifts to their children. They fed and clothed them. They forgave their children when it was their right to punish them. And the father in the story of the prodigal son would have been seen as quite the ridiculous person. A father would never accept an insult from his son and then give him his share of the inheritance while he lived. That insult was grounds for disinheriting him. A father would never just forgive his son without consequences. And a father would never, ever go running to greet his son who had rejected him, weeping over him, rejoicing that he had returned, and then throwing him a celebratory party. These are not the actions of a father, but the actions of a mother, which makes this particular parable so outrageous when Jesus told it. In a speech she made to the UN several years ago, Emma Watson argued that a result of gender equality was that both men and women should feel free to be sensitive. Both men and women should feel free to be strong. There is definitely something freeing about God not identifying as male nor strictly acting out stereotypical male behavior, but there's something much bigger at play here than our stereotypes. There is something about the essential nature of God that is at stake. Stereotypes aside, fathers beget children, mothers bear and birth children. Both are essential to the process. Additionally, both male and female are incomplete analogies of parenthood in the sense that neither can produce a child without the other. Our fear of describing a disunified God has caused us to paint an incomplete picture of God. The female imagery of God is more than a reminder to change our stereotypical mindset. It is more than a challenge for fathers to be kinder to their children. And the problem with both of those understandings is that they still elevate the human male as somehow closer to the image of God than the human female. The essential nature of God is not male, nor is it female. It is neither and both at the same time, just as God is so much more than we can comprehend. In the beginning, both male and female were created in God's image. And today, gender has no power to dictate whether any person has the capacity or the mandate to reflect the image of God back to our world. No matter who you are, you were created in the image of God. And that is an incredibly beautiful thing. Yahweh, Lord God, the one who was and is and will be, 
the creator and sustainer of all, the one who gives life, who births us, who brings us into being, who raises us and who carries us, the infinite divine mystery, and the one who knows all mysteries. Thank you. Thank you for choosing us. Thank you for calling us. Thank you for bestowing upon us your very own image, the capacity to reflect you to a world that desperately needs to see you. May we always love and serve you and honor you with our lives. Amen. Could you spin the whirling planets, fill the seas and spread the plain? Will the mountains fashion blossoms, call forth sunshine? Sweet.